Now listen, this is the early bird special. So, well, Lord, help us in Christ Jesus' name as we come, Lord. Uh, and this is just a time for us that are early, just to, to come and acknowledge you. You died on the cross for our sin. You rose from the dead. We belong to you. We're so thankful. So, Lord, give us the early bird special that we can take and, and enjoy and think about as we prepare for the message today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in honor of Joe uh, Sapelia being here early enough, um, we, we like to usually wait until he gets here to start the official uh, program. And um, so, you know, I'm thinking yesterday, and it, it's been really... Um, my life is, is going through all kinds of changes, just like yours is, and uh, with the physical issues and uh, just all kinds of weird things that are happening, I just, um, the Lord's constantly working on me, and, and so as we went through the first couple chapters of James, we were talking about the, um, our perspective on life as a Christian, somebody who calls on Christ, and one of the problems is that people say they call on Christ, but then there's no there's no Holy Spirit in them. There's no power of God in them. And their perspective on life is pretty much like anybody else. And every once in a while, they'll throw up a prayer or they'll ask somebody to pray for them. You know, they'll figure, gee, I'm, I, I, I've got fire insurance. I, maybe I should try to do this with God or whatever. And yet the Lord says that's not, you know, what it's all about. And the early bird special to me was that for me, I've gone through this conviction. Uh, the, the more I study the Word of God, the deeper I get into it, the more convicted I am. And that's why last week, if you know, I shared with you in the mornings, every morning, what I do, based on what I've learned the Bible, is that the Psalms, the, the songs of Psalms, and I can't sing, so I got all the ones I could put together, and I try to get Nancy and I together, and we, and we pray those Psalms every morning so I can get my heart, you know, going in the right direction, my mind, and let the Holy Spirit get in my thoughts early, early, early in the morning before I get a chance to go wandering off, you know? In other words, before I get a chance to go and do a bunch of stuff on the phone, before I get a chance to go and do things that I might want to do or get, I, you know, it's what if I'm on vacation, whatever, I just try to dive in, you know? And then there's another prayer I said that I haven't shared with you that I'm going to share. I promise that I pray first before I even do that, okay? It's sort of a, a setup for my mind as to who God is, and so the early bird special today is to, is to come to grips with the fact that we can say we're Christians and we can say all the right words, but unless we yoke with Christ, he says it, it, he doesn't know us. And that's chilling. It's chilling. And it's been, uh, I, <laughs> Eric's hiding back there behind uh, Dwight and I, I was going to this big meeting a couple of weeks ago and and Eric knew about it. I said, pray for it. And then he sent me a little text. He says uh, from, uh, from the spirit or whatever, you know, I got a word and it's called, and said, listen, you know, <laughs> oh Lord. So I, I went into the meeting, which I'm supposed to be handling this meeting, this big deal between two parties and doing everything. And I just went in there and I said, okay. And I sat there and listened. Now I knew I had to say something because otherwise they're going to wonder what I'm doing there. But I, I went ahead and listened and then I closed out and then I left, you know, and I made up, I got, I got everything back, you know, hopefully we'll get it going. But what the listening part is, is that the first, you know, you read the book of James and it's one smack right after another, okay? And so we're going to talk about that today. So I don't want to get off of my message today, but I want to give you a little early bird special. And I want you to listen to it because I want you to think about it so that you can then talk about it with your friends and other people that are Christians, wives, husband, children, grandchildren, and everything, and the Lord really put it on my heart, and it's in, um, let's see, early bird special, here we go, here it is, it is in Matthew 7, 21, and 22, and 23, it says, this is Jesus speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What? If you call upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you believe he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose from the dead, why would you not be in the kingdom of heaven? Now listen what it says. But only the ones who does the will of my Father 
who is in heaven. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What's the will of your father in heaven? Read the Bible. Read it from the beginning to the end and understand the fear of the Lord and who God is. And that your heart will turn and do what we did just last week with the Psalms, right? To prepare our lives every day because God's real. He's there. There's nothing that happens to you. Pete and I were talking about it, about the sovereignty of God. He knows all your problems. He knows what's going to happen. He has no problem with resources. He has no problem with healing. He can do anything he wants because he's God and he's sovereign. Unless, listen carefully, unless you don't actually believe that by faith. And you're just living out there like everybody else, like a ping pong ball in the ocean. And listen to this. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? These are teaching and preaching and doing all kinds of wonderful things. All these guys, see them all over. And in your name, drive out demons. How are you guys doing on that one so far? I'd say these people are moving right up to the first string, don't you? You remember God says there are no first string Christians. Did you know that? There's only sinners that by the grace of God are saved. That's what I've been dealing with lately in this thing he's been doing with me. Now listen to what he says. It's hard to even say. And in your name, perform miracles. How many, you know, if we got guys in the name of Jesus Christ out there performing miracles and they're not going to get there? This is pretty heavy. Remember, Joy, when you went back east and you guys were looking for all the spirit-filled places where they were doing the hocus pocus because you wanted to go where it felt like this. And remember, uh, we were talking about the filling, feeling the spirit and all that kind of stuff. This is really, really dangerous, guys. Sorry, early bird special has got a little teeth to it today. So here's the thing. Now, listen. And in your name, perform miracles. And he says, then I will tell them plainly, just plainly, I never knew you away from you, you evildoers. Now, notice the key word, evildoers. And what and and then what are we going to see in James in a couple minutes when we start that and and we'll pray and we'll go to James and but this early bird special is is that James said don't just listen to the word of God listen don't just listen to it do what it says he says James is trying to explain what Jesus is talking about James his brother his half brother is trying to explain that if you have faith unto salvation there's going to be works. And if you don't have any works, there's no real faith. And in fact, if you look at your works and they're what? Bad fruit. You better get back on your knees and have some time with Jesus. Well, the last thing here, and I'll read this. Verses, um, let's go back up to verse uh, 14, 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter it. This is a gate, a religious gate. They enter it, okay? But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Okay, early bird special is this, guys. God exists. He's totally sovereign. Come to grips with it. Absorb it. Think about it. Why do you come to Bible study? Why do you come and walk in here and go all that trouble to get here? You guys missed the early bird special, but I promise I'll get you. The thing is, is that many people say they're Christians. Many people call upon the Lord, Lord. And Jesus tells them right here in Matthew, I never knew you. You said you were a Christian because you wanted fire insurance. You said you're a Christian because you wanted me to help you get past your test so you could get your law degree or you wanted to do this, or your kids went to the hospital and somebody got sick and you wanted them to get well. You know, you want all the good stuff that you have somebody who has more power than you, but then you just want to go off like everybody else and do whatever you damn well please all the time because you just want to do what you want to do. And what does James say? He says at the end, what's the last thing in, in 127 after he says taking care of the widows and the orphans, because that's what it means to sacrifice and give. What's he say? He says, do not believe polluted by the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So that's the early bird special. How's that? So don't be pushing me too hard on the early bird special. You're going to regret it, okay? So, you know, this is what God's been doing to me on that. So 
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the blessing to be here. All these guys that show up, what a blessing here. And the fellows that are on Zoom, I pray. The most important thing we want to pray, because we want this to truly be in our mind, our heart, and our soul, that this would not be just something we would say, something we say, oh, yeah, we agree with this, but something that truly is everything to us. And that is that you love us more than our sin and that we are sinners and we acknowledge that. And we repent every day as your Holy Spirit makes it clear to us. And we come to you now. We come to you now and thank you that you came and you became our sin. You who knew no sin became our sin and went to the cross to die on a cross for us. You took the wrath upon yourself, the wrath of the Father upon yourself. Oh, Jesus. You separated yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You, God, in the Son, came and died on the cross for our sins. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day, and you rose from the dead. And you defeated the power of sin and death in our lives, and you made us born-again children of the living God. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. We are so thankful that we can call upon you, Abba, Daddy, Father. We know that you're there. Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, is our advocate. We know that we can come to your throne room of mercy and grace today, and we ask you, oh, Jesus, give us, give us the word today through your spirit. Nothing of me, Lord. You know that you've been convicting me more and more about less of me and more of you. I pray, Lord, today that you bless us with your word and your truth and your spirit. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, guys, you can tell that this study in James and this whole we started, if you guys remember last year, it's been two years now, I guess, whenever we started this idea, or not an idea, but the Lord put it on my heart, this idea of understanding the spiritual darkness that's around us. Because the spiritual darkness, and, and this is something I think we can all agree with, is that it has become so evident. It is becoming so aggressive. It is it's coming out of it, it, what's happening. We're seeing it in the United States now because we as a nation turned ourselves away from the true power and the protection of our nation, which was this, this understanding that it was one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, with the amiable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that were granted to us by our creator God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the God of the Bible in whom we trust, in God we trust. And that this whole idea that there is only one God there's not multiple gods. And if we allow you into our country, that doesn't mean that we're giving up the fact that our country was based, based on the, on the, on the Christian faith, on the word of God, and, and our, our constitution, um, just everything about the documents that formed our country. And then on and on, it doesn't mean everybody's a Christian. It means that everybody respected this nation that was created by people who sacrificed and they brought it and said, we cannot possibly have a democracy. You have to have a, a, democ a, a republic, a republic, a democratic republic. Because you can't possibly let everybody just gather up in the cities. Jefferson said this, everybody lives there. They all get in there and everybody you know, buys their votes and does all kinds of things. And you'll just vote somebody in to give everybody the money. Just give everybody what everybody has and just take over. And they said, a country can't exist that way. My country has to be based on something that is a rock, that is the truth. So here's the deal we're going to talk about today. So our country was based on the truth, that there is truth. There is discernible truth. And this truth is represented in the rock, the rock of our salvation with Jesus Christ. There's a truth. So what ends up happening is you take this truth and you build this country on this truth. And the truth was then manifested in the Declaration of Independence, articles, and all, all the things that we have that we have that are there for us, okay? All these rights, we think that we're in America. Now we find out that the FBI, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, the FBI and the uh, CIA, the NSA, um, the CIA, and the Justice Department have all decided now to take all of their forces and all the things and turn from criminals and from the foreign enemies to turn to domestic pursuit of people who are not in agreement with whoever happens to be politically in office, which is against the Constitution and against everything about them. But they do it 
because now they say, well, you can't do that. It's illegal. They go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, that's illegal. You can't do that. They say, so what? We're doing it anyway. And the generals say, we'll do whatever we want. Because we're the generals. And one guy quoted and said, we got the guns. What are you going to do about it? Now, listen, guys, we're all sitting here right now. Everything looks okay right now. You, were you guys aware? Do you remember we had that lightning storm? Was it Monday night? Right? All of a sudden, out of nowhere, and you see the pictures of it, and you see the lightning and the storm and everything. That just happened. It just happened. The, the brand new stadium, all of a sudden, they had to hold Monday night game up by 35 minutes. I mean, think what happened. Oh, my gosh. The Titanic hit the iceberg. $5 billion stadium, and they had to shut it down and slow it down. That is nothing compared to what's going to happen. We live in an insulated area here in Orange County. It's not safe anymore to go anywhere because the, the police are not allowed to police anymore. You leave your little encampment and your guarded gate community, and you go just a few miles over here and a couple miles over there. You just wander around somewhere. And if somebody wants to do something, they'll do it. And there's hardly anybody there to help you. Why is this happening? Because we, now listen carefully. This is a biggie, okay? Because this, this is not a political thing. This is about Christians who say they're Christians, but who do not believe that God exists. And they don't act like God exists. And they don't pray every morning like God exists. And they don't trust God with everything like they should. And they are polluted by the world. And they allowed the world to take over. Now they're going to turn the Justice Department against parents to come in and tell the school boards that they're out of control and the teachers are out of control. And we don't want you to treat or teach uh, the race theory thing, critical race theory, or the 1619 project. 1619 project makes me is my hot, hair on fire. I was a high school history teacher, U.S. history you know, and, and world history. And the books that I had, they, those, it's against the law to use those books. They want to rewrite everything. That's what the 1619 program's about. So that your children will not hear that. And then this idea, transgenderism, general neutralism, that is an abomination before the Lord. The word of God says it very clearly. Has anybody here bothered to say that? Oh, I don't know if I could say that. I, you know, my company and everything, and then I'll lose business. And, you know, I can't do this. I can't do that. Listen, seriously, don't get off on a tangent, excuse me for saying this, like a vaccine. That is a tangent. Do you understand? That is a minor, what, what that is, is a, uh, what's going on with that whole thing is a symptom. It's a symptom of something way bigger. And here it is. It's, it's Christians who are supposed to be light and salt. Now, listen carefully. They're supposed to be light and salt in the darkness. What do you mean, what darkness? The world is dark because the world rejects vertical truth. Vertical truth is Jesus Christ through the word of God coming in through the Christians. But the Christians don't have time to study their Bibles. Why is it that we don't have 2,000 guys here every Wednesday morning? Every one of you guys know what we do. It's almost impossible for you to get here, let alone for you to bring other people. Seriously. What is it that we're not about? This is not, nobody here, nobody here is first string. So there's no fall to roll and you don't, there's, you just show up and have some coffee and we'll talk about God. Because listen, when you come in this room, I've noticed this with people that come and go. When this, we come in the room, they, the people who stay here, we know God exists. I know God exists. And I know that he's sovereign based on what he's given me in the word of God. Not based on me, because I'm better, based on what he's given me. Why are you talking so? I've had people, they come along, they'll listen outside. They'll see outside, walking down the corner, and they'll listen for a while. You know, in the old, old days, Kitten used to sit in the back in the kitchen and listen. Now, listen carefully. Now, I've had people say, well, why are you talking so loud? What's going on? I can't help it. I'm a weirdo. 
I also believe that God exists. And if I don't penetrate and take what he's given me in the Holy Spirit and bring it to you, you're not going to get it because you're too busy looking at your phone, figuring out what you're going to do next. You know, I have to come in here and pull all the tables forward because if I didn't, every one of you would sit at the farthest table in the back, other than these strange guys in the front who are so old, they don't know any different. So what ends up happening? Do you know why the Wednesday morning group was so successful for so many years? I'm serious. We used to have 180 guys here all the time. You asked me the other day how that whole thing went down. Do you know why? Because I never told, I told everybody there's no homework. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to make best friends with the guy next door. And you're not going to ask him. Nobody's going to ask you probing questions. How many kids do you got? What's your wife's name? You know, where do you go to school? And that, and that. You just show up, and we're going to talk about God. We're not, and, and I love singing and everything, but I don't sing. So we're not doing music. We're not singing. And I said, and I'm horrible on announcements. I can never remember what they are, and I don't write them down, and I just don't want to do that. So if you want somebody to do announcements, from the, you come in. But this group is, is here not because they don't know what to do with us. We are here because we've been here for 35 years. They know how to get rid of us. That is serious stuff, okay? Now listen carefully. Some people ask me, well, what is this First Love Ministries USA thing? It's just the guys who used to be here, guys who are here, got together and through this time believing that God exists, that these people came in. And, and believe me, I didn't go out to try to figure it out. It just happened. Where'd that thing come from? I don't know. God gave it to us. What are we going to do with it? Send it to school and hope it grows up and goes away. God gives you children. He gives you life. If you look back over your life, he is He's leading you. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to trust him with it? And I have people saying, well, Don, why don't you, why, you know, ministry's fine, but why would it grow so big? Why is it so big? Why wouldn't you send out the emails? Why do you need this and that and everything? I don't know. I don't know. I really, I really don't know. You know what I do know? That God's so tired. I know God's looking at me saying, no, you've got to stop being, you know, so restrictive in your faith. You've got to believe that I can do whatever I want. And if you don't trust me, that means God talking to me, if you don't trust me to go ahead and tell everybody what we need and don't be embarrassed and don't be afraid that somebody's going, oh, look, it's too much. I'll get somebody else. That's the fear of the Lord that comes upon me. And I'm telling you right now, guys, this thing going through James is, is just driving me crazy. Do you know why? Because what God's doing is he's convicting me of all the areas of my life where I'm just not believing that God exists. I just, do, do you, you know, if we sat down and we talked about the word, now listen carefully, if we talked about the word sovereignty, I've, I've been going through the Bible, it's like the light's coming on. You're like, I never noticed it, but I'm reading through the Bible because I said this the other day at somebody, where was it? I, I was, and I said, somebody talking about the Bible, and I said, well, they, they would said this, that, and I think, say, I don't, I've read the Bible like 40 times or so, and I go through it each year, and it's not, it's, it doesn't say that, and then I thought, oh my gosh, done it, what are you saying that, who are you, then it sounds like I'm bragging, and I'm boasting about reading the Bible, and you're not, and you know, you're, I'm better than you, and I, and all the way home, I'm driving, the Lord's got on me, and, and I say, well, well, Lord, I know I've read it 30 times, <laughs> maybe 35, it might even be 38, I may be 42, and the Lord kept saying to me, he says, listen, Don, you may, it, it, I am the one. It's me. All the credibility is about me, not about you. It's not how many times you did this. It's not what you did over here. It's not this, because what did we just read a couple minutes ago? All these people were doing miracles and prophesying and everything. And Jesus said, I don't even know you. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. Oh, Lord, Jesus, forgive me. Too much of me, not enough of you. Now, maybe none of you guys have a problem with this. I know it's sometimes it's great. You can just watch somebody over there burning on the stake or something. It's interesting. Well, maybe that's what you're doing with me. I don't know. But the reality is this. 
We either believe God exists or we don't. If we do, we have to start looking at life differently. That's the perspective, right? And then once we look at life differently, which is we're going to review in about, we got a few minutes to do that, and I'll go through this. What happens is when we review that and we look at the perspective, then what do we got to do? How do we process our life? How do we process what we do? And James keeps reminding us and reminding us and reminding us that you constantly have to look at your life and make sure that you're not being overcome by the darkness, the logic of spiritual darkness. That you live your life based on the truth, which is Jesus Christ. That's what happened to our country, as I was talking about. All the Christians just gave up and began to compromise with the world. We figured it was easier. Everything went smoother. If we compromised, if we compromised our faith, we compromised the truth is what we did. We compromised the truth of who God is, what his word said. We got to the point where certain people won't even teach on certain parts of the Bible. The kind of stuff I was just talking about a minute ago. How many times do we hear people talking about when Jesus Christ separates the ghosts from the sheep? Seriously. And when people say they accept Jesus Christ, I believe, what are they believing? Do they, are they humbly coming to the Lord in great repentance of their sin and the reality that they were going to go to hell? Do we talk about hell? Do we talk about the second death, the lake of fire? And that this is ultimate, that it's not messing around. You, if you don't know Christ and you don't trust him and love him, you are not going to make it to heaven. I and mean, if you don't make it to heaven, the things are so terrible. And then I was talking to my wife about it the other day, and it just blew her mind. I was thinking, honey, uh, I said, do you realize that people, she said, well, you're separated from God and all this. I said, honey, the wrath of God, the Father is upon them for eternity. That means God, you're not separate. You're going to wish you were separated from God. You're separated from the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Because you rejected Jesus Christ. And you thought you could pull it off on your own. In fact, I remember as I became a Christian and I went, I wanted to be a certain kind of Christian. I didn't want to be like that guy. That was me over there looking at me down the road. I want to be like that guy over there. And that guy over there allowed the United States of America to slip into this. All those Christians that got along, go along, let it happen. Doesn't mean you don't love people. Doesn't mean you're not nice to people. Doesn't mean you're not gentle to people. Doesn't mean you're not compassionate. It just means you do not mess around with the truth. You, you hear me? You do not mess around with the truth. Now, when I was teaching my daughter how to drive and all that, and we, she was very young, there's one minor detail, and Bella will learn this when she learns, that's my granddaughter, is the car can be washed, can be pretty, it can be new, it can have great tires on it, you can put all the stuff in the car, you can do everything you want to do, and you go along, but if you don't put gas in the car, it won't go anywhere. And if you don't have enough gas and you didn't notice, Back then, they didn't have cell phones. So when you know ran out of gas back then and you were a young girl driving to college or doing something, it was a big deal. You're stuck out in the middle of no place, don't know anybody, you're vulnerable because you were not thinking. The truth is, without gas, you don't go no place. Do you understand? And as a Christian, now listen carefully, as a Christian, without truth, the rock, you got nothing. You got nothing but disaster ahead of you. I'm talking as a Christian, as a nation based on the rock of the truth of who God is and what it means to be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, the inalienable rights granted by our creator God in heaven. If you don't have that anymore, what do you got? There are no gas in the tank. This sucker's going down. Do you understand what it means to base everything on truth? And then you go and talk to the people today politically, and you go talk to these people that are doing all these different ministries and they're doing all kinds of things. And there's a discussion you'll find it's really weird as to what truth really is. And I would say, oh my gosh, that's why every morning I pray those Psalms. 
because I want truth to grab me by the neck and hold me. I want truth. And that's why the prayer I told you I pray about who God is. And that's why I read the word and I study it because I don't want to get confused as to what the truth is because I have ulterior motives, guys. The world is at me all the time. And I want this and I want that and I want that and I have desires for this and desires for that. And uh, constantly a battle between my desires. This is not the evil one. He can't touch me. I've had people come in here and say, oh, the evil one, we got to pray. You go, he ain't coming in here. He's not welcome here and he knows it. Because we're not going to compromise here. No, I'm not running for election. Do you understand that? I said to my wife the other day, I think I'm going to run for governor. She looked at me like, you couldn't be dumber than a rock, you know? I said, honey, I just like, give me one week. One week to just tell the truth. But nobody could do that because if they did, nobody would ever talk to them or nothing. They just wouldn't work. Listen carefully, guys. We have advocated the podium so that the compromisers have taken over. And in fact, we think compromisers are actually the best people. They're not. They're more dangerous than the ones who won't compromise. The ones who are on the wrong way going the wrong direction. The ones who are going the wrong way, the wrong direction. They've overplayed their hand, by the way, as you well know. Because they forgot that there are some people who are not totally mentally disturbed and lost. So what we need to do is trust God that he is sovereign. That is a big word again. We'll talk about it later. Sovereign. And because he's sovereign and we trust him, we can base our life on the truth. So that I'm not saying you run around and hit people upside the head with it. No, you give truth with love, right? And what is love? Love means you don't judge people. You don't condemn them to hell. You don't do this. You don't do that. I didn't condemn anybody. Jesus Christ came, John chapter 3, and said, I came for whoever you know accepts Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, they'll be born again. But then he said, he said, I didn't come. God says he didn't come to what? To judge the world. Why? Because it, we're already judged. We're already guilty. We're already on our way to hell. Romans uh, 5, 8 says that, well, we were still sinners and enemies of God. Christ came and died for us. In other words, it's not like we may make it, we may not make it. We're already on our way to hell. But by the grace of God, he sent Jesus to save us. Now, do you believe that? And if you do, why would you believe it unless you thought you were lost and you were a sinner and you were on your way to hell? But if you don't know anything about hell and nobody's ever told you about that, you don't know about sin. See, that's why it says in the Bible, if you don't, if you don't discipline your child, you hate them. Do you know why you discipline your child? So they will know that there is a right and a wrong. Now you say, yeah, but they discipline for this or putting your, you know, washing your cup and putting it away. That's no big deal. Everything's a big deal to a little kid. That's why you see little kids and you say to them, you say something to them and they cry because their, their feelings are hurt. Great. You don't overdo it, but you let them know. I remember when I was younger and my grandfather told me I was staying at my grandmother and grandfather. In fact, we lived there and, and I wouldn't eat my lunch. For some reason there was a, it was a, back then it was, there was no air conditioning. This is a long time ago out on the farm, out in the desert. And I remember they made me a, a cheese sandwich with mayonnaise, white bread, and uh, some kind of cheese, okay? A yellow cheese. And I liked it. I, you know, it was the kind of thing I'd eat, and it was fine. But I just didn't eat it. And my grandmother, she was a nice grandma, and she would say, well, here it is. And my grandfather took that thing. He says, you're taking a nap. And he took that sandwich, and he says, you're not coming out of this room until you eat that sandwich. Your grandmother made it for you. That's your lunch. You're eating it. Well, I was in there and I was, uh, you know, I'm a boy, I, you know, I think I must have been all of six, I guess. And then one of the first things I remember, and it was on a little up here on a little uh, ch ch chest of drawers and was sitting right there. I could see the plate and I could see it. And it was sitting there, it looked pretty good actually for a little while. And then I sort of fell asleep. I woke back up and it was like 105 out there and it's dry and everything. I looked back up at that sucker and there it was, the bread was turned up like this, the cheese was over there and it. And it looked like it'd been out in the, out in the you know, roadkill is what it looked like. 
man, I knew I was in trouble. I was in trouble. And what did that teach me? Another time, seriously, this is what happened. I'm out there running around, having a good time. And my grandfather, I had a rake, you know, all those, you know, the steel rakes, they're steel rake like this out on, we're on a farm, so it's a farm, steel rake. And I had put it, I had done something, I put it over there. I thought I was a big boy. It was turned up the wrong way. My grandfather came and grabbed by the neck and the bags put me here. He said, you see that rake? You never leave a rake like that because somebody will step on it, that thing will come up and whack him in the head. He just traumatized me. My whole life, I'm 74 years old, I'm still thinking about it. You know what he taught me? What he was teaching me? Truth. Consequences. We don't teach that anymore. When are we going to go back to one trophy? The winner wins. If you're coming second place, what are you? You're the first loser. What's the deal? Well, they're going to have a bad feeling about themselves and their self. What if you should feel bad about yourself? You're a loser. Become a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. You know, that's the deal. Are you a winner or are you a loser? Oh, we can't have winners and losers. Everybody has to be the same. Socialism, Marxism. Take it away from the winners. Somebody else does better, go get it, take it from them, and give it to the losers. That makes everybody better, right? No, it doesn't. It destroys everything because there's no truth. God said that if you win and you're really good at what you do, you take what you have and you sacrifice and you give it to the poor and needy. You give it to the orphans. And the more you give, this is really amazing. Nancy and I have been praying about it. We're excited about it. The more you give, God says, the more he'll give you to give. You can't outdo God. And we do need the funds. So, yes, you can take that as a fundraiser. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And sometimes I remember Nancy and I, there's no 10%, 12%, 40%. In the New Testament, it's give as the Lord has put it on your heart and be joyful. And the more, the better. And for me, Nancy and I, we've been thinking about, I remember sometimes we couldn't hardly give any, we'd do anything. And then all of a sudden, the Lord blesses us and we can give this and that. And, and I always, every year when I look back, we do the taxes and I look at what they are and I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I had no idea because I can't, I, I can't sit around keeping track. I have to just whatever, wherever on my heart and whatever I have, praise God. And somebody look at me, well, so you're a real loser. You talk big, man. Look at you. I say, yeah, but I got guys that don't talk big over there, but they're big givers. What's happening? God's working in their life and God's working in my life. I've told you guys many times that my equity, when I learned a long time ago in the Bible, my equity is in heaven. Every time I prepare for this group and come here and pour my heart out, and my wife used to say, honey, don't be so vulnerable. Don't tell them everything, please. I said, honey, I'm not smart enough to know when to stop. It's who I am. It's just me and the Lord up there. There's nobody else. So what's the Lord going to do? It's just me and the Lord. It's not you and the Lord. You want to come up and do it? No, no. It's just me and the Lord. So what's going to happen? That means me is going to become nothing and useless, and he's going to become everything. How can he do that? He wants to use whoever it is. He's used you in the past. Do you remember? Remember how it was? Remember how you were way beyond yourself? Remember how he used you? You remember how you had to deal with children and problems and how he used you? You remember how he had to use you in situations that you didn't even want to be part of, you didn't even want to know about, and how he used you? Because you belong to him. Because you, in the book of James, it says, because your faith turned out showing what? Actions. And those actions prove that you have faith. And then you come back and say, Lord, I don't know what it did. I don't know how it happened. And I'm, oh, I'm so concerned about what I said and how I said it. Lord, forgive me and help me and cleanse me. And I read your word. And now I'm reading. I'm all excited about reading your word. And then I read it. And now I feel terrible about who I am. Because I didn't do this and I didn't. And the Lord says, that's right. You didn't. That's right. You're a loser. That's right. You did all those things. That's right. You were guilty. That's right. You sinned. And I'm so glad you told me about it. You're forgiven. Let's start and do it again tomorrow. You mean I can go to sleep now? Yeah. You can go to sleep now, Don. Poured it all out. I died on the cross for your sins. Now go to sleep. And tomorrow 
you start out with me in the morning. You don't get off on all that stuff. You don't start worrying about those deals. You know, I got some great opportunities. And then every time I think about that, I say, oh, I'm going to pray for this. Then, God's sovereign. What am I worried about? Wait a minute. Is he really sovereign? Because it, it's shocking. Did you know every once in a while, to be honest with you, every once in a while, I actually get that. Every once in a while, I have a moment. Some people call this moments of peace and moments of the presence of God and all kinds of things. But did you know that every once in a while, <coughs> his Holy Spirit and your faith come together. Uh, here, your faith and, his Holy, and the Holy Spirit come together and they give you a moment where you come to the realization that God is who he says he is and he is sovereign and he loves you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, I'm going to read these notes to you because this is a review, okay? So when I read this, I'm going to just read it through, and you let the Holy Spirit convict you, okay, as to what it says to you. I call it James, yoke, in quotes, process review number three. It says, therefore, this is James 1, 21, 22, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. How's that for today in the United States of America? General neutralism. You know, all the other things. Trans this and this, that, and the other. Get rid of it all. That is evil. It's evil and so prevalent. Isn't it prevalent? And humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The word of God in you. How much? It's the word of God is the truth. And that's what saves us. Jesus Christ is the living word. Do not merely, this is the one I got to tell you right now. If it doesn't get you, you're not listening. This is why we don't have more people here. This is it. Do not merely listen to the word and so, be, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Does anybody not get that? I got it. And boy, it just smashed me. Then James 1, 25, he says, and by doing that, you will be blessed in what you do. If you do what the Bible says, God will bless you. Do you believe that? You see, you can't believe it if you look at all the things that are going on. You could only believe it if you believe that God's sovereign and he can take all the things that are going on that are weird and he can bless you through them. Do you actually believe that? James 2.5 says this. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? This is so awesome. Listen, aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Key word, those who love him. James 2, now notice people who are poor and destitute, they have a tendency to just go and trust God and love him because they have no else. They have no money. They, they can't play God. People, that's why God, that's why God says you can't serve what? Both God and mammon. Mammon means money. Mammon actually means everything money can do. Everything money can do. So you have enough money. It says, got more money than God. Remember? You ever heard that? That's because they can use money to be their own God. God hasn't chosen the poor. And here we go. So here we go. James 2.13 says, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Whoa. I'm talking to a lot of Christians right now about the idea of what mercy is all about. That means you don't extract from somebody what you, you, you deserve. You just let it go. But she's so mean to me. And she did this and she does that. And she continually does the same thing. Show mercy. Show grace. And God will bless you. James 3, 1 and 2 says this. Not many of you should become teachers in the church. Boy, God, this is where God got me. He's just pounding me. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. In other words, if I don't stand here and tell you the truth of what I did this morning and the early bird special, if I back off, I'm going to be judged for that. I had to tell you. I had to tell you. Indeed, we will make many mistakes. I love that. Thank you, Lord. So everybody makes mistakes, including me, a lot of them. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. And that is not me, and it's not you. James 3.8 says, but no one can tame the tongue. It's, it is restless and evil, 
No one can tame. Full of deadly poison. James 3.13 says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. James 3, 17, 18, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism, and it is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace, and listen to this, and reap a harvest of righteousness. James 4, 1 through 10 says the following. This is where we're going to go next week. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill for it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't, now listen carefully, this is a critical one, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't believe he's sovereign. Now listen, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want it only, only what will give you pleasure. You don't want it so you can help others. You don't want it so you can serve the Lord. I always told the Lord, Lord, I don't want to ask people for money. Look at, why don't you just, look at, I'd be happy to put up $10 million a year, Lord. You just, you give me $100 million, I'll give you 10 It's no problem. Give me $20 million and I'll put in $5 million. It's no problem. I'll write all the checks. And God said, you know, I don't like your attitude. I don't think your motives are right. So I'm not going to allow you to do it. And you're going to have to go out and ask people. I don't want to ask people. I don't care. You belong to me. You say, I'm, you pray every morning. You do this. You teach the word of God. You're going to do what I tell you to do. I don't want to do what you tell me to do, Lord. We have this conversation all the time, all the time, because I'm constantly fighting this idea of who I want to be and what I want and my motives. And God says, your motives have got to change. My will, not your will be done. Who's God here? They don't get because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Verse 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship, this is a biggie. This one hurt me really bad. I'm sure it's going to hurt you. I'll make sure it does later next week. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Let me say that again. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God. Are you a hero on TV? They love you. Everybody wants to vote for you. You're doing really good. You're in deep trouble. I'm going to have to tell my wife about this one. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? Do you think the word of God's written for nothing? The truth isn't out there for you. They say that God is passionate, that the spirit is he's jealous for us. The spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. He's jealous for us. And the spirit of God that we would come to him and want him, not the world. And he gives peace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we'll finish with this and we'll be done. Verse seven. So humble yourselves. This is where I'm at in my heart right now before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you, do you believe that? You resist him and he will flee. Greater is he that's in, that he is in you than he that's in the world. Do you believe that? Because you have to believe that to be courageous. You have to believe that in order to believe in God's sovereignty when you see everything going to hell in a hat basket. You have to believe that when the devil's out there doing everything he can. You have to believe and know that you have the Holy Spirit within you, all-powerful resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the devil doesn't want to have a thing to do with that. Now listen here. Come close to God. That's that morning prayer that morning psalms, all the things that I'm, in my heart, in my life, I try to do, and come to the Bible study like this, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your lo loyalty is divided. There it is, is divided between God and the world. That's where we are. That's the problem. That's what we're going to be dealing with next week.
We'll deal with that for the rest of our life. The last verse is, let there be tears for what you have done. And I have been in that mode now for some time. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. It's breaking my heart as to what a sinful, stupid person I've been. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. You know, I never, I read this for years about how God wants us to be. He says, I just couldn't, he says, sadness instead of laughter, gloom. And, what, what, what is he talking about? I want to be happy. We want to be joyful in the Lord, right? He says, well, if you read the Bible and you study and you understand who I am and what I expect and everything, you're going to begin to realize how you are not it. You are not it. You cannot do it. All those people that he said, I never knew you. All those people that did all that stuff. They weren't in Christ. It wasn't Christ in them, the hope of glory. It was, it was them out there doing good stuff for Jesus. So that they could come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, look at what a good, good little Christian I am. He says, you should have been mourning over the sinfulness, even the slightest. How many of you guys here understand? And you do. I'm closing. I got one minute. Here we go. Driving down the street, minding your own business, doing nothing. We're listening to a Bible study. And all of a sudden, something comes into your mind. You remember this. You go to that. You think about this. You went into there. And all of a sudden, there's a thought, some sexual thought about something you shouldn't have been thinking about. How about you're thinking about business? You do this, you do that. And you think, well, if I just make that call and say this to that person, then that person will probably call over to that person and you can sort of manipulate the deal. Well, see, if God doesn't exist, now I'm not saying that that's wrong. I didn't say that I was going to do something terribly sinful. It's just that I was not trusting God, but I was going to make it happen. I'm a, I'm a make it happen guy. And God says, who do you think you are? You are a sinner. But by the grace of God, you're on your way to hell. And you are out there acting like you're God and you're sovereign and you're going to put all this stuff together. Why don't you settle down and relax and trust me, focus on the word of God and start praying about the ministry and all it needs and start working your way through where I want you to go. Oh, Lord, that's really difficult. That's, that's a, it's impossible. Yep, that's where I want you. You got it, Don. I want you working on impossible stuff all the time so that you know you got no chance of succeeding. Just where we want to be. I'm God and you're not. That works. That's how he says. And then I start to get what? Gloomy, sad, because I know I can't make it. He says, okay, humble yourself before me. We got this covered. God's there. He's sovereign. He's all powerful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and died on the cross for our sins. Thank you that you rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives, making us born again children, living God. Our names are written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. So now we pray that you bless us today as we go and bring us back tomorrow, tomorrow, next day, Lord, next Wednesday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.